Good evening and welcome to our public worship service here at St John's Presbyterian Church Annerley with one of our retired pastors, Reverend John Roth, leading worship this evening. Again, your observance of the usual COVID response protocols is appreciated, uh, just in terms of the utilisation of the QR code, the wearing of masks indoors, and being aware of the physical distancing practice. Again, we commend to you those of our church family dealing with some difficulties. We particularly think of those affected by COVID in varying measures. We think of all of our church family members in retirement complexes. And again, we commend to you those who, have, uh, who are seriously ill. Just a reminder that our Pastor Martin has been on two weeks annual leave, returning to ministry as of tomorrow. Our, our usual groups are currently in recess, except for our Saturday morning prayer meeting that is resumed and will be next Saturday at 7.30am. Next Sunday services, that's the 30th of January, will be as usual, both morning and evening. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to the call to worship. Thank you. This evening hour is a great privilege that uh, we can spend time in the word of the Lord to sing praises to our Lord and our God. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16 verses 8 to 13 it reads, Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvellous works that he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O you seed of Israel, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. O Lord our God, you sit in the heavens, you hear every creature that speaks and prays to you. You're unlimited in your uh, ability. Uh, we, as human beings, are so limited in even our imagination. But you are beyond your creation, yet you have created mankind in your image. And you have sent Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be our mediator and saviour. So we pray tonight as we come in this manner of worship of, of singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs of reading the scripture and preaching the word uh, that each one of us, while either here or viewing, may indeed behold the, the glory of God and the greatness of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us sing the first hymn tonight, which is Praise the Lord, you heavens adore him. Praise him, angels, in the height.
moments before the, the readings of scripture tonight, come before the Lord in prayer. <coughs> oh God, we are so amazed by your greatness and your glory, your very nature, that in part has been imparted to, man, imparted to mankind, but only in a shadow it seems. We are so glad to be able with David of the Old Testament to give thanks unto you and to call upon your name. We're so glad to be able to advertise all your marvellous works among the people of earth, to, to sing unto you, to sing psalms and to uh, talk of all your wondrous works. We can do this in the, the speaking of creation with the establishment of the, uh, the, the heavens that we see, the stars, the suns and the earths that are out there. But Lord, we praise you because you have come to walk with mankind and in the form of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to do a marvellous work of salvation and redemption. These are great works. O oh Lord, as we have considered these things in our own heart, we are, we are sometimes filled with uh, an unusual joy, but a joy to be expected as we have trusted what Christ has done on our behalf. And we're filled with a sense of sadness as we speak to others about your good things. And others may see the, the rain falling upon the land, upon their farms and their properties. <clears throat> and it often is the case that in Australia it's either a drought which is complained about or it's flooding rains which are complained about. But in the midst when there are good seasons there there is a sense of forgetfulness. So Lord, teach us, we pray. Forgive us for our forgetfulness, but teach us to be, to be thankful amidst all your marvellous things. Thankful for the wealth that you have given to each one of us in particular. It may be tens of millions for some, but that <coughs> tends to lend towards unbelief. It may be poverty, extreme poverty for others, and that tends to unbelief. But for the Christian to be thankful for the clothing of the day and for the daily bread and the food and daily provision for a place in which to live and uh, a peaceful country, oh God, we're very thankful. And we do pray as the service continues that we may trust you that your judgments are sure and certain. Let us be mindful always of your promises that you have given to thousands of generations, the promises of eternal life, even the covenant that you made with Abraham and, and your oath unto Isaac and confirmed in the same to Jacob and the law that was given to Moses, all things pointed toward the Saviour, Jesus Christ, who would come in the fullness of time. The Saviour through whom we now pray. Amen. The scripture readings tonight are from Jeremiah 44 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. Firstly, Jeremiah chapter 44, verses 1 to 18, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews who dwell in the land of Egypt, who dwell at Migdol, Tarpanhas, at Noth, and in the country of Pathros, saying, Thus says the Lord God, uh, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, You have seen all the calamity that I have brought on Jerusalem and on all the cities of Judah, and behold, this day they are a desolation and no one dwells in them because of their wickedness which they have committed to provoke me to anger in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they did not know they nor you nor your fathers 
However, I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not do this abominable thing that I hate. But they did not listen or incline their ear to turn from their wickedness, to burn no incense to other gods. So my fury and my anger were poured out and kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. And they are wasted and desolate as it is this day. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, why do you commit this great evil against yourselves to cut off from you man and woman, child and infant, out of Judah, leaving none to remain, in that you provoke me to wrath with the works of your hands, burning incense to other gods in the land of Egypt where you have gone to dwell, that you may cut yourselves off and be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth. Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers, the wickedness of the kings of Judah, the wickedness of their wives, your own wickedness and the wickedness of your wives which they committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? They have not been humbled to this day, nor have they feared. They have not walked in my law or in my statutes that I set before you and your fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for catastrophe and for cutting off all Judah. And I will take the remnant of Judah who have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to dwell there, and they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They shall be consumed by the sword and by famine. They shall die from the least to the greatest by the sword and by famine. And they shall be an oath, an astonishment, a curse, and a reproach. For I will punish those who dwell in the land of Egypt, as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence, so that none of the remnant of Judah who have gone into the land of Egypt to dwell there shall escape or survive, lest they return to the land of Judah, to which they desire to return and dwell. For none shall return except those who escape. Then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods, with all the women who stood by, a great multitude, and all the people who dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you, but we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth, to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and pour out drink offerings to her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food, were well off and saw no trouble. But since we stopped burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. Would you please turn to the New Testament, the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. Verse 1. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying. 
a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Let us consider for a moment the <clears throat> offerings that we have given uh, to the Lord and uh, then we shall have a prayer of dedication. vision uh, to all of those who have sought you with all their heart for the provision that they have needed in this present time. Lord, we're extremely thankful. We know that some have not gained what they wanted, but we pray that all of your people have what they need. Our hearts are moved when we see the, the tremendous disparity of wealth in the world but we realise that uh, when you were on earth, you did not live in, in great mansions or have great properties. In fact, you, you had very little, which was divided up by gambling at the foot of the cross when you departed from this earthly realm. And yet, being the second person of the Godhead, our Lord, you are, you, you are the, the God of all creation. And all things belong to you, including us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The next hymn we shall sing tonight is uh, Jesus Shall Reign Where'er the Sun.
and before the Lord in prayer and considering the needs of others. The Lord, we do pray that uh, we will never consider ourselves to be in such a great distress, uh, worse than anyone else, because there are so many that are suffering for the sake of the things of God, even at this particular time. When we think of mission abroad and a mission within this nation, we realise that uh, many people are isolated and uh, with the, uh, the current plague that is troubling the world, there are believers isolated in, in great cities. They're from every nation, every tribe, every family, and they're isolating good way, in a good sense, but also there's a fear of what might happen. And as the preacher this morning adequately and very well spoke on these things, there is nothing that man can do to uh, affect the, the operation of catastrophes in the world because we realise according to scripture that, that you have authored many of these things. We cannot, uh, we'll never accuse you of evil, though many people do. We'll never accuse you, Lord, of uh, not providing uh, for the people of earth and those who are sick and dying, because you're the God who loves us. You're the God who's provided eternal life uh, for those who believe, your people, and you provided uh, an eternal separation uh, for those who have uh, chosen in their own way to follow the ways of Adam and not believe the gospel that has been preached. But we speak spe specifically of those who believe and trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. That where they are at the present time being impacted by isolation that they may find comfort in uh, unusual strange ways that you provide uh, a comfort within the heart and the mind, a comfort perhaps from uh, those who work around, or family. We know at the present day that families uh, are going through very difficult times. Uh, we think of our own people in this congregation, and though some are afflicted by various illnesses, uh, by viruses, by uh, and some have been afflicted by the dishonesty of others. There are those who are held down by uh, various uh, ailments within the body and within the mind. We pray, Lord, that relief may be granted to them. We pray for our nation's governments who have opened borders uh, everywhere that uh, I may doubt whether that was the right thing. But Lord, everything is in your hand and we pray that your Holy Spirit may work within this nation as well as within the nations of uh, other people. We think of Esther Lovely in Japan as uh, indicated in our newsletter uh, that there may be a translator for the worship services and a correct venue for the congregation and that as she travels and uh, around the congregation and learns the language that indeed there may be a movement within that nation towards a belief in Christ Jesus. It's a nation that has been closed and was closed for hundreds of years. A nation that was warlike 70, 80 years ago but a nation today that is somewhat different but needs to hear the word of God preached. We pray for the stewards too, that uh, they may operate and, and serve within that nation and there may be one or two converted here and there. We pray these things in and through the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. The next hymn is from Rejoice 486. Psalm 91, and it's safe in the shadow of the Lord.
chapter of 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 5, about uh, Christ Jesus and uh, his relationship to his mother Mary. But 1 Timothy 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Shall we pray? Lord, this is a precious verse. It's very clear, extremely specific, excludes all other mediators or mediatrixes. For there is only one mediator that really should never be misunderstood. But there are many whom we love who have placed other mediators in line with Christ. And that should not be done, for it leads to unbelief and to uncertainty and lack of assurance. We do pray that we may be clear about these things and not place anything between God and Christ and ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Some time ago I <coughs> preached on this matter, a little series, and I'm speaking on the practical aspect of 1 Timothy 2.5 uh, in this matter of uh, mediatorship. There is a great deal of fear that resides in the world and, and it resides in uh, members of our congregations. There was a great deal of fear because they may have been brought up in another denomination that uh, did provide other kinds of mediators between God and men. And there are those who uh, would be critical of the way of grace through Christ Jesus who would in endeavour to try to insert priests and mediators into our uh, Christian life. Now, there is no real fear within true Christianity. There is uh, real freedom because the scripture shows how the love of God which is in Christ Jesus has been demonstrated to us. But it is a tactic of the evil one from the beginning of time to invent for us all kinds of imaginary mediators and in so doing this has caused people to depart further and further from God. And mankind in his rejection of the one true God has deliberately ignored God's way of salvation through the one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself for all. Now God is very present with us. He's not far from every one of us. There have been theologically educated people who have spoken to me about the fact that the God of the Old Testament in their opinion it was a fact, the God, God of the Old Testament could only be accessed through priests. But even in the Old Testament, and I don't have all the scriptures that can be given on this tonight, God was very close to those folks. We were told of a sympathetic high priest, namely the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, through whom we can come and approach the throne of grace without fear. And even in the Old Testament, there was always the God of love who pleaded with his people. There was the word of God in the Old Testament who pleaded with his people. But even then, as well as these days, there are earthly priests who introduce a morbid kind of fear. Now, in other parts of Timothy, uh, the books of Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7 it says that God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind and again in 1 John 4.18 it says there is no fear in love but perfect love casts out all fear because fear has torment 
and he that fears is not made perfect in love. Now those who introduce another type of mediator <coughs> are representing God as one who appears to be still distant and separated from us. <coughs> they appear uh, to be representing God as very unsympathetic and they represent even Jesus Christ as unloving. So they attempt to introduce another mediator and this is extremely offensive to the Lord Jesus Christ and God who sent him to be our Saviour. Because the Son of God holds out his hand to us as a brother. He is our Lord but he considered us, considers us his people and we are united to him in order that he may raise us to heaven. Jesus Christ very clearly puts it in Matthew 11, 28 onwards. And he said, Come unto me, all you that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now that is a, a wonderful promise, a tremendous description spoken by Jesus Christ himself. He is telling us to come. We've been labouring under all sorts of heavy laws and, and uh, endeavouring to, to please God, but he says, come, you shall find rest unto your souls. And, and those who speak of other mediators are not adding rest to our souls, but they're driving a wedge between Christ and the people who love, he loves. They place him high above the clouds and distant and unreachable and inaccessible. But we should never forget, as the text says, that the man Christ Jesus gently invites us and takes us, as it were, by the hand to God the Father in order to be reconciled to him. Now previously God was the object of morbid fear and terror but now through Christ we have been reconciled to God who loves the world. Now Christ is definitely the only one to turn the key to open for us the gate of the heavenly kingdom so that we may appear in the very presence of God the Father with confidence. God the Father through Christ is very friendly to us. In the modern parlance he has friended us. And he will welcome us into his holy presence forever. Now the next point I make is that Satan has his devices and through all the ages he's endeavoured uh, to disturb this good relationship between God the Father and ourselves through Christ disturb it by introducing other mediators. Uh, they could be priests of any description. They could be heavenly figures such as angels or ancestral saints. And this was for the purpose of leading people astray from the right path. It's very common in various religions today on the earth to introduce other mediators and they're not <coughs> mediators at all. It seems rare in these days for famous people to acknowledge Christ as the one and only mediator between God and man. Some religious leaders skilled in deception will put angels into Christ's place as mediators. As, as Colossians 2.18 from the pen of the Apostle Paul says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels and not holding the head which is Christ Jesus our Lord. As an illustration I'd like to mention a particular uh, woman who is introduced as a mediatrix into this relationship between ourselves and God. It's Mary the mother of the Lord. And for various reasons, people 
have been taught from their, their very childhood uh, to pray to Mary and to honour her as a, as a mother of Christ who can meet all your needs. Now Mary, to those who venerate her, has the heart of a sympathetic mother whom people can call upon at any time. Now, don't get me wrong because Mary should be held in high regard, but not given the, the honour she is given in the church centred in Rome. Her prominence is reinforced by many statues that are erected in buildings depicting her and the stories of miracles that she has supposedly done and is doing throughout the world today. She is further elevated by praying to her <clears throat> and in some cases even worshipping her. Many in Ireland will travel to the town of Knock on the west coast of Ireland and in that uh, town of Knock in County Mayo there is Ireland's national shrine uh, to the Virgin Mary. In August 1879, news spread throughout that nation of uh, an apparition of Mary, and uh, many people flocked to that place called Knock, K N O C K, and it became a place of pilgrimage uh, for those who revere her. In 1976, a place of worship was built called the Church of Our Lady Queen of Ireland. Knock has become a place of deception for many. In the church grounds, uh, holy water is on tap and there are many stores in the town selling crucifixes and statues of Mary, just like the little statues of Diana that were sold by the craftsmen in the city of Ephesus, Ephesus in the book of Acts chapter 19. Now that city of Ephesus to which Paul had uh, travelled worshipped the goddess Diana. The apostles caused a great uproar when they preached Christ. And there was a certain man called Demetrius who made a great deal of money making silver shrines to the goddess Diana and he is very upset because the scripture says Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, many people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. And at one stage, the crowd erupted in, uh, and shouted over the space of two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they kept repeating that until they were exhausted. And they said that all Asia and the world worshipped the great goddess Diana, whose image fell down from Jupiter. Now there seems to be a great similarity in a plan to encourage people to worship Mary and the plan to worship Diana. It doesn't take much spiritual discernment to figure out who is behind all of this. Because all around the world, a supposed apparitions of Mary have happened causing people to flock to shrines where she is worshipped. Whenever she has appeared, you will find people praying to her and given over to this kind of worship. Now in Rome's doctrine, Mary is called the Queen of Heaven. Yet the New Testament never refers to her as such. It's important to remember that the Mary of the Bible, the mother of Jesus Christ, never knew or imagined that she would be venerated by millions because she was a meek and humble woman chosen by God to bear the Son of God into the world. She was certainly blessed among women. And according to scripture, Mary exhibited a true and genuine piety as well as a deep humility which always accompanies holiness. Mary could speak of her experience with a quietness of spirit and gracious self-control. She is certainly a woman to be honoured because she bore our Saviour Jesus Christ into the world. She was devout, she was courteous and with her mind centred on the promises of the Old Testament. But one thing Mary never did, 
She never claimed perfection for herself. She was born like the rest of us in sin and shaped in iniquity. Now I know to some who might be watching this, uh, they might feel offended by that very thing. But let us believe what the scripture says. And the scripture showed that she did have human faults and she needed a saviour as others did. She said in Luke chapter 1 verses 46 and 47, it says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour. That's what she said. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour. Because Mary believed that the Son of God was indeed her personal Saviour. Now the only reference to the Queen of Heaven in the Bible is found in the book of Jeremiah. Israel had provoked the Lord to anger. Entire families were involved in the evils of idolatry. Jeremiah 7.18 says that the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Some versions might change that to, to something else. And to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger, God said. This is so important. I remember as a child with my brother gathering wood to put in the stove. Remember my fa our father kindling the fire. Mum would do it too. Remember mum kneading the dough, but she did not make cakes to the Queen of Heaven. But these people in Israel were devoting these pastries and cakes and the drink offerings to other gods called the Queen of Heaven. And, and God used Jeremiah to warn the people against their idolatry, but they would not listen and listen again. Now, Brother James read this before. I'll read a couple of verses. They said, the Israelis said, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. We will not listen. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goes forth out of our mouth to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. The Israelites paid a heavy price for their idolatry and so will everyone that's involved with the worship of idols today. Whatever that idol may be, this is what the same Lord and Saviour said to them. And this shall be a sign unto you, saith the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my words shall surely stand against you for evil. Now, God makes it very clear that we are not to put other gods or graven images or idols, they could be an idea or a concept, before Him. Remember how the Lord said, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. De Deuteronomy 4.6 In this context, that is a warning to people not to have any other idols or mediators of whatever kind. Now the Lord continues and says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. How true that is. How true that is. If you're born into a family of unbelievers and you are 
you turn to the Lord in repentance, how difficult that is. Now God's position with idols is that they interfere in the manner of worship that God desires. Idols of any sort cannot be helps to worship, for mankind needs no aids to worship other than God's provision. Man can only approach God on God's terms. There is no helps for that. There can be no mediation between God and man except that which God has ordered and arranged. That's why in a Protestant church such as this congregation, we don't have statues, we don't have idols, we don't have uh, points to worship in this place. Because there must never be something between God, Jesus Christ and each one of you. Ministers are not priests. We, we don't come between a, a sinner and God. Because God the Father has sent Jesus Christ to save sinners directly. When, when mankind begins to establish how he might approach God, man is setting up his own terms and his own requirements and inventing his own religion. When I was a young pastor, I, I went to many different kinds of seminars and conferences where some bright chap would say this is the way to convert people. Could have been evangelism, explosion, any kind of thing like that. Use this method and you will save many, many people. When well, now I look back and see how, how silly that was. With all due respect to those who might use it. But it's setting our own terms. The church growth movement and, and the mechanisms that might be used. It's inventing our own kind of religion. The initiative in our salvation always belongs to God. The only proper and lawful approach to God is on His terms entirely and by grace. With my own father, I was never able to negotiate terms with my father. It was either what he said and never what I said. And I learned a great thing there. Because we can't negotiate terms with God. We can't approach God and tell Him that He should do this or that to save mankind. Not at all. The Bible says it was the love of God that was directed toward us. Because, as 1 John 4, 9-10 says, Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation. Pay penalty for our sins, turn the anger of God away from the sinner. It was all God's initiative. It wasn't ours. It really is the height of arrogance if any Christian denomination should tell God how we should relate to him. So many believe that Mary is the Queen of Heaven and that she can answer prayers. We can all suffer the same problem in different areas. Protestants can be quite judgmental of others while forgetting the great mistakes they are making, especially in telling our God what he should be doing and how he should do it. By illustration, a previous Pope of, of Rome granted and across the board remission of all temporal punishment due to sin called a plenary, plenary indulgence and in July 2013 in World Youth Day uh, in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil the participants were told that if they prayed with a contrite heart raising devout prayers to God and invoking the Blessed Virgin Mary, Queen of Brazil, as well as other patrons and intercessors of the same meeting, that they may encourage the young to reinforce their faith and lead a holy life. This required prayers that were specifically directed to her while kneeling and praying before images of her. Now Martin Luther, tried all this 
in his day, crawling on his hands and knees, praying at every step up to the cathedral. Many people have gone on Emmaus walks through the stations of the cross, all sorts of uh, different ways to try to reach God. The scripture is very clear that when you study the Bible in relationship to prayer, you'll find that all prayers are to be directed to God and not to Mary, not to any other saint, and certainly not to our ancestors. Uh, Jesus Christ never ever gave a hint that his mother was capable of miracles or answering prayers. When anyone seeks to pray to any other person, living or dead, then they are raising that person to the level of God himself. The Godhead, the only place to receive your prayers. And the Lord God is open to every prayer of his creatures. He hears them all. He is infinite in capacity, unlimited in what he can do according to his will. Now seeking to contact the dead, either saint or dead prophet or Mary who has passed on, is really necromancy and is forbidden in the scripture. Now God directs us by saying in Deuteronomy 18 verses 9 to 12, he says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God gives you, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. What's Australia doing at the present time? We're living and thinking according to the spirits of this land. God said not to do it. There shall not be, Scripture says, there shall not be found among you anyone that uses divination or a consulter with familiar spirits, unclean spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. That is, God has clearly said that we are not to pray to the dead. Be they a prophet, a saint, Mary herself, our own ancestors, parents, missionary, whatever it might be. For there is only one, according to the writing to Timothy, there is only one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. There's only one that we are prescribed to pray to. And we cannot pray to any other but God in Christ Jesus. Now when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, it was to God the Father who is in heaven. While he was on earth, that's how it is. And the scripture made it clear that we have one mediator between God and man, and that mediator is never Mary, it's never Muhammad, it's never a saint, it's never a dead prophet, it's never an important person in the life of the church. Because the scripture says, and it's hard to make it simpler, I think, there is only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now Jesus Christ is our high priest. And he always lives to make intercession for us. It's not Mary. It's not the Queen of Heaven in the Roman Church. It is not the humble handmaid of the Lord described in the pages of the New Testament. The Church of Rome has made her now to be sinless. The Bible shows that she was not sinless. She was a lovely woman, a beautiful lady, but she never claimed herself that God was her saviour. Oh, sorry, she never claimed herself to be a saviour. She said that God was her saviour. She said in the scripture, my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my saviour. I don't want to trip of the tongue to destroy everything I've just said. Now some leaders have elevated and given Mary divine powers. They're not found in the New Testament. 
Mary is never seen again in the pages of the Bible after Acts chapter 1 verse 14. She was never revered by the disciples. She was never mentioned at all in Paul's epistles. Mary's biblical role has been terribly distorted and she has been made into an idol by false doctrines and her followers. Now Mary in heavenly places right now would not be aware of this worship of herself. She can't see what's happening here on earth, neither can those who Christians who have gone before us. They cannot see it because they are beholding the face of Jesus Christ, their Saviour and our Saviour. The Lord Jesus Christ who is that one mediator, that one who gave himself a ransom for many. No wonder the, uh, the apostles who wrote in the New Testament said like the Apostle John, little children, that's what he calls us, keep yourselves from idols. And that means anything that will put itself between God, Jesus Christ and man himself. We have direct access to God through Christ Jesus who is the only mediator and our high priest. You don't need your minister to do that. Certainly not. Might help, the elders may assist in showing you the scripture, but as John says, keep yourselves from idols. Heavenly Father, there's so much that can be said, but the scripture speaks for itself. Extremely clear that there is only one mediator. I don't know if some versions of the Bible change that, but I hope not. Indeed, the, the apostles never considered there was anyone else. There is only one great man who is God in the flesh, and that's Christ Jesus, through whom we do pray. Now let us uh, sing the concluding hymn. Um, it's Rescue the Perishing. Care for the dying. There are, there are so many. I, I just heard these days the Canadian government uh, is going to imprison anyone who tries to convert transgender or homosexual for five years, up to five years. Uh, they're not um, setting free swindlers or thieves. They don't get into heaven. The scripture says that homosexuals, practicing homosexuals, will never enter heaven. And yet the Canadian government is moving to instruct churches and pastors uh, to make them acceptable. When we think about this, we as a church have to be absolutely sure where we stand. And uh, that's why we've been set up, not, not as a charity institution, we've been set up to preach the scripture and to seek the conversion of people. God is the one that converts. All we do is preach and teach. Let us sing this hymn, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying.
peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of His Son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you all. Amen.